Free Coffee Fridays are returning to the podcast all month long. I've partnered with my friends at Java Sock to give a handful of lucky listeners the new self-love Java Sock sleeve and a free coffee on me. Weekly winners will be announced on Instagram each Friday in the month of May. And all you need to do is email or DM me the code word coffee for your chance to win. It's that easy. Send the word coffee, nothing more, nothing less. Just the word coffee by email or direct message and you're automatically entered for that week. The code word coffee will be the same each week. So if you didn't win this week, you can still win next week if you send in another message for that week. You do have to be a United States resident at least 18 and be a first time winner. Two ways to play, one weekly prize pack and your next iced coffee, matcha latte, hot tea, or whatever you enjoy drinking is on me. To email the code word coffee, visit peaceofmepodcast.com or DM the word coffee at peaceofmepodcast on Instagram. Thanks for listening and for being part of the Peace of Me community. Let's shift the paradigm to prioritize our peace and focus on the positive while creating balance to make living our best life the ultimate goal. We'll talk boundaries, self-care, mental health, and overcoming obstacles. You'll hear interviews and fresh perspectives to support you along the way. Let's elevate the conversation and level up our self-growth game. This is the Peace of Me podcast. Mother's Day is coming up, and that might have you feeling some type of way, especially if you have a rocky relationship with your mom or if your mom isn't in the picture due to death or circumstance. Maybe you're a stepmom and feeling a bit mixed and anxious over the upcoming holiday. And Mother's Day may be hitting you hard if you're trying to be a mom. Holidays like Mother's Day can really put a magnifying glass on your own situation and bring out all the emotions. Hi friends, I'm Lexi Lee. If you're new to the Peace of Me podcast, welcome. And if not, then welcome back. I recently received an email from Etsy, the website where people sell things they've created, but it was about Father's Day. It was an email allowing me to opt out of any future Father's Day communications, especially if I found them triggering. So today I want to offer you the same trigger warning. In this episode, I'll be chatting with Charlie Dice from Life Beyond Infertility Podcast to talk about her infertility struggles. So if you need to press pause or stop listening, I get it. These conversations can be really difficult, but if you're still here and listening, then you might appreciate Charlie's story and how she's changed her perspective to focus on the positives of her experience. Now, Charlie has helped many other women navigate their own challenges with infertility on her podcast. Although she's pressed pause on releasing new episodes of her show, there are still several episodes to listen to for support if you're struggling too. So let's take a listen. Hi, Charlie. Welcome to the Peace of Me podcast. Hi, Lexi. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. I'm excited you're here too, because I think that your story and your journey is really going to resonate with a lot of the listeners. Um, So before we get into your story, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself first? Yeah. So I'm 36. I'm happily married. I don't have children. I have uh, two fur babies and a horse, and I live with my husband in um, South Central Pennsylvania. We have a 15 acre farm and we're just, you know, trying to follow our passions and live life the way we want to. And it's a, it's a nice little piece of, of heaven for us. Awesome. Awesome. Now you have a very personal journey and you're also a podcast yourself, which I just mentioned in the, uh, in the introduction of this episode. So Wherever you're comfortable, take us from kind of the beginning, but just kind of tell us about your experience, what you went through with your infertility journey, um, the emotions, time frame. Kind of just take, I know that's probably going to be like a long answer, but take us through um, what you've been through. Yeah, I guess I'll start um, at the beginning. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mean, I never wanted to be a mom growing up, and I think that's a little different than at least what you hear um, a lot of women talk about in the infertility space. You know, it's, I always wanted to be a mom. I always knew that that was my 
my life's calling. And it wasn't for me. I was very into my, you know, school and then eventually my career. And, you know, my husband and I were into our hobbies and it just wasn't something that, you know, I felt that I needed in my life until I turned 30. And for whatever reason, the biological clock just started ticking and I thought that mine was broken. So it was a bit of a shock to me to finally feel that maternal pull. And my husband had always wanted children, but he respected my wishes to, you know, not possibly not have them. But when that, you know, when I turned 30 and we started trying, we thought that it would just be, you know, easy peasy because all of our siblings have three children each. They never had any issues getting or staying pregnant. And so, you know, we had always uh, used protection and everything because we thought, well, that's going to be us. And we, we weren't ready at that point. But when we were ready, you know, we started trying and a year went by and nothing. And then another year went by and nothing. And we started to, you know, kind of get in the back of our minds, like, well, maybe this isn't going to be as simple as we thought. And, we eventually went to, um, you know, our OB to start and they did the preliminary tests. I think that everybody gets done and they didn't find anything wrong. They just said, well, it's, it's unexplained female infertility, which, you know, in and of itself makes you feel like even more of a failure than you already felt like month after month. But, um, eventually then in August of 2020, we got our first positive pregnancy test. And so we thought again, okay, we did it. You know, this is it. This is going to, at the end of this, we're going to hold our baby in our arms and we're going to continue on with life. And that didn't happen at 10 and a half weeks. uh, I miscarried. I had to take myself to the ER. My husband was away that weekend and, you know, I was so upset and just so confused that I left my cell phone in my car. And you know, when you go to the ER, it's never a short trip. And so for six hours, no one could get a hold of me. No one knew what had happened and I couldn't, you know, walk out and walk back in. So it was a whole ordeal. And the bedside manner of the doctors and nurses in the ER, you know, left a lot to be desired. And it just kind of gave me this whole new outlook on, what women go through to try to, you know, create a family, especially when, you know, it doesn't go as they tell you it does in fairy tales and books and all that. So we ended up then trying again. It took about eight months until I felt my body was back to a normal cycle where we could start trying again. And it, uh, you know, at that point, we ended up having two more miscarriages over the next four years. Um, My last one was the day after Christmas last year. So that was tough. But eventually, you know, after that last one, we decided that, you know, we'd gone through IUI, we had done one round of IVF, and we decided that, you know, this isn't something that we want to spend the rest of our lives chasing because it's not guaranteed for any of us, let alone those of us that struggle with it. And we didn't want to, you know, spend our life savings and possibly the years of our lives that we were physically able to to do things. And, you know, we just wanted to find ourselves again. And so we decided after that day, after Christmas last year, like this is it, you know, we're done. We're not going to we're not going to continue to go down that road and we're going to figure out how to live as a childless, child-free couple. So was it hard to get to that, to make that decision of, you know what, this is the end of the road for us? It was, I think prior to that day, you know, it was in the back of my mind at least for about six months, even when I found out that I was pregnant for the third time. And I would say that in talking to my husband, he also, you know, had it in the back of his mind. We just didn't say it out loud to each other because we were afraid of what that meant. And so, yeah, it was definitely something that we had thought about. It wasn't a split second decision. And it was something that even after we decided it, it was like, is this really what we're doing? Like, is this it? Or are we going to, you know, 
regret it and want to try again. But I think we both decided that when you make a commitment to something, then that means that you value it. And that means that you have to honor it. And we decided we were going to do that. And so we, we never looked back. Yeah, that has to be, um, so difficult. And I'm, I'm so sorry for what you've been through and thank you for sharing that because I'm sure that's not an easy conversation to have. Um, and you know, each, let me ask you this, when you have each miscarriage, there has to be a grieving process to that. And then here you make this decision at the end of, okay, we've decided this is not for us. There's a grieving process to that as well. When you're trying to accept, you make this extremely hard decision, very emotional decision. And now you have to accept that this is our life moving forward of, I didn't want kids, but at 30, I I did. And then, but that's not what my future holds. So can you kind of share maybe what the grieving time frame might have looked like between, you know, kind of, I guess, between the, the miscarriage, but also kind of accepting this new future? Yeah. And I think the thing, at least for me, that helps to remember and what I tell other people that ask me that question is that it's always going to be there. You know, there's always going to be a bit of grief there. I think around any type of loss, you know, or trauma that people suffer, but What's different about infertility grief in particular and and moving on from it, because that's a different type of grief than the actual, you know, loss of the physical pregnancy. Um, and it's really like a, I call it a deathless death because there is no defined period. You know, when someone passes away, a loved one passes away, you know, they're there one minute and not the next, but it, it has a very defined before and after. And infertility and deciding to move on from it is is a deathless death because there's so many triggers that bring it back up again. And it's not defined. It's very gray. You know, one day it might be I walk down the street and I see a pregnant woman and that triggers me. Or the next day it could be I see one of my friends announce on social media that they're having their third child and that might trigger you. And so, you know, in a way there's not really, I feel like I'm still, I feel like it's something that I'm going to deal with the rest of my life. But in order to move forward to accept it, I did a lot of research on my own because I found there just wasn't a lot of information out there and people weren't talking about this. And, you know, one in six couples deal with infertility and, you know, one in eight don't come out of it with a, you know, live earthside baby. And so I thought, this is crazy. There has to be some, you know, information out there um, to help people. But, you know, what really, I guess, you know, back to your question, the grief ebbs and flows, you know, some days obviously are better than others, but it just becomes again that I committed to this decision just like I had committed to starting a family. And it's just kind of what my life is now. And I know that there's some sort of opportunity to be gained from this loss. And that's how I decide to look at it. I don't want to be living the rest of my life, you know, in that state that I was right after we made the decision. I thought that's no way to, you know, I, I'm at the time I was 35. I was like, I'm not going to feel this way for the rest of my life. Like, that's crazy. I might as well just not be here. So it really was just, you know, making the commitment and valuing it enough to decide that I was worth it as a woman. I was worth it as a human being. And I had other value besides my ability or inability to reproduce. And um, that's kind of how I decided, you know, how I started just kind of putting one foot in front of the other. That's... That was actually my next question was, how did you pull yourself out of that? So that was a really interesting thing that you just said of, you know, I didn't want to feel this way forever, but I also realized that my value is not just my ability to procreate or not. Like that's such a really good point to make. So what else did you do? I mean, for other people who are listening right now who are maybe struggling to get pregnant or are experiencing infertility or maybe even miscarriage, um, where should they start? How do they kind of try to pull themselves out of this? 
I think a lot of it, you know, I think the first step is really doing a lot of value work. Um, and that means, you know, writing down either, you know, on your computer, on your phone, in a notepad, whatever it is for you, you know, what do you value? What do you prioritize? What makes you happy or what made you happy prior to who you were on a fertility journey? And a lot of people I ask that question to, you know, that I work with, and they don't know how to answer that. And so that's the the telling sign for me is that, you know, until you can really sit down and think about the answers to those questions, you're going to just be in this constant cycle of, you know, overthinking, thinking about whether or not you're going to regret it. So writing down every day, what do you want? What do you value outside of creating a family? And maybe it's even still creating a family, but what do you, how do you want to do that? You know, do you want to go the surrogacy route? Do you want to do um, adoption or foster care? Like, I'm not saying that just because we made the decision or you make the decision to not have a biological child, you can't still have a family. But, you know, is that something that you value? Is that something that you want? Because a lot of women I talk to, they get to the end of this journey and they're deciding whether or not to continue on. And I'll say to them, you know, well, do you even want children at this point? And they'll sit back and they'll be like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't know if that's what I still want, you know? And I also, you know, I read a great book and I would very much recommend it. I know you can, I think you can still get it on Amazon. It's called Sweet Grapes and it's by Dr. Jean Carter. And it's an older book, but it really put into a perspective for me, a mindset shift of feeling like I wasn't, you know, I was not infertile or fertile, but there was this third option that I was no longer infertile. And what that means is that when you are no longer trying to get pregnant, it's not something that you're actively trying to do, then you're not meeting the medical definition of infertile. And so you're not fertile because you don't have children, but you're not infertile because you're not meeting that medical definition. And so this third option that was presented in this book of being no longer infertile really opened my eyes to, you know, this whole other possibility that I didn't have to define myself by this period of my life anymore. And that coupled with the value work and also gratitude work, uh, you know, every morning I still to this day write down three things that I'm grateful for. And you might find at the beginning of your journey that you don't know what that is. You know, you you can't really even think about things that you're grateful for, but just something simple as, you know, I got to take a breath today. I got to wake up today, you know, and, and even if you don't feel like you want to do that, it's still something that, you know, you're able to do that other people may not be. So start as small as you need to and take as much time as you need to to process. Um, but the value work, the gratitude work, and then also just doing some reading, you know, from others that had been down this path really kind of helped me, you know, to start to dig out of that hole. Sure. Now, how I'm thinking about your husband in this as well. You know, he's going through his own grieving process. You guys are probably trying to support each other. So how maybe what you need might be different than what he needs. So let me ask you this. How can we best support our other halves who are also grieving this process? And how do you I guess not, I mean, everyone's going to be different. It's going to be everyone's different situation, but how can they best support you as someone who might be feeling obviously a little bit differently going through this experience? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a tough question because men, obviously we know are very different than women and they process things differently. And my husband may not necessarily process things the way that, you know, your partner might, but for me and my husband personally, you know, he's one that likes to think about things before he says something. And so knowing that about him, I just kind of had to give him space because I'm the one that's like, there saying, how do you feel? You know, what do you think about this? Like, what are we, you know, 
and I'm badgering him and I needed to take a step back and say, okay, I know he's sitting over there not talking to me, but that doesn't mean that he's not thinking. That doesn't mean that he's not processing what we're going through. And so what I did is I just let him, you know, have the space that he needed, you know, for a few days or a week. I I don't remember at this point what it was, but before I started really kind of asking those questions of him and the way he supported me then was knowing that, you know, I wanted to communicate about it. I wanted to talk about it. He, you know, I told him, I remember very vividly, I said, I need you to fall apart with me today. I need you to not be stoic, to not try to be the strong one, to not be my rock. Like I need to see your emotions about this because I'm feeling like you just don't, I don't want to say care, but you're not as um, devastated about it, I guess, as I am. So I need you to fall apart with me. Can you do that? And he did. And, you know, it was a really, really profound and emotional experience, but it brought us so much closer together because I was finally able to see how it was affecting him. And he was finally able to, you know, communicate with me what he was feeling. So I think it's just a matter of obviously knowing your partner, knowing their personality, knowing how they process grief. And if you don't know, then ask them, you know, and and let them tell you and then take a step back and allow them to to do that, allow them to process that. Um, and then you can come together and try to get both of your needs met, you know, as a couple um, to try to move forward. Does mm-hmm. that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. And that's, you know, I love how you said, I need you to fall apart with me. You know, that's really a very real and raw answer to say, this is what I need right now. I need, I need to know you're with me. I need to know you feel this. I need to know we're in this together. So I, that, yeah, absolutely. And I was thinking too, you know, going back to the night that you had to drive yourself to the ER, go through that traumatic experience by yourself because your husband was out of town. So to no fault, how do you, how did you not carry, or how did you, and I'm, I'm not, I don't want to assume that you had resentment, but how do you even have that experience by yourself and then, and, and be feeling a probably, I would assume a mix of emotions and then get back to a good place where you're not maybe feeling resentful again. Cause I'm just thinking as people are listening to this, they're thinking, Oh my gosh, she did this by herself. She's got her phone in the car. You know, how, how awful that had to be. So how did you even that miscarriage alone? How did you get through that? And this might be a an odd answer to this or maybe a non-traditional answer, but I actually was thankful that I was there by myself. And I don't say that because I wouldn't have wanted my husband there, but for me in that moment, that being our first miscarriage, me not having a clue what was going to happen to my body or what was going on in my body at the time. And also the fact that we had kept our trying to conceive journey, a complete secret from everybody other than the two of us. I truly was grateful to be by myself in that moment because even when I got back in the car after, you know, getting the results of the ultrasound and not having a heartbeat and, you know, the whole nine yards and seeing like 40 missed calls from my husband, I didn't want to I didn't want to talk to him. I didn't want to talk to anybody really because I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to put into words what had just happened. And also I was feeling very much like a failure and like it was my fault that I had done something wrong, you know, because it was my body that miscarried. And so I, it wasn't so much resentment that he wasn't there. It was, it was more of, you know, how, how do I not feel like I just let him down? And that was the hardest thing that I had to process. And it was something that when I got home that night, I finally called him, but it was like two hours later. And, you know, I remember him saying like, why didn't you, like, why didn't you answer my calls? Why didn't, and I told him I left my phone in the car and all that, but 
you know, I remember saying to him, I, I'm sorry. Like I just kept saying, I'm sorry over and over again, because I didn't know what else to say. And that's really how I felt in that moment. And I don't think that, I think because our journey had been so long, we had, you know, there, of course there were days that we resented each other, I think, but we also knew that, you know, it was something that if we were going to do it, we were going to do it together either way. And we just decided, you know, each morning, I think in marriage in general or relationships in general, like we just decided each morning, like we're going to wake up and we're going to choose the other person. You know, we may not like them that day. We may, we, we love them hopefully, but it was something that I was like, well, I'm just going to choose to move forward with him children or not, because, you know, I love him and he's my best friend. So I guess, you know, I'm sure a lot of women maybe feel or would have felt resentment in that situation in the ER and afterwards. But for me, I'm a bit of an introvert anyway. So it felt, I felt grateful to have that time to just process by myself. Mm Mm-hmm. And I'm going to take that maybe because I always try to give people the benefit of the doubt. So let me also look at the other side of this, which is your husband finds out a couple hours after. So Mm -hmm. he is part of this process. He finds out after he was not part of it. How did he handle finding out later on? Yeah. So he had known, I had called him on my way to the ER and I told him, you know, I, I'm bleeding, but don't worry about it. Like, you know, I'm sure it's fine. And then he was out of cell phone range as well where he was at. And then obviously I left my phone in the car. But when he got home that weekend, you know, he said, he's like, I really wish that I could have been there for you. I wish that, you know, you would have told me sooner that, but you know, what was he going to do really? He was away. He wasn't at a place where he could get there. But I do know that, you know, obviously he wanted to support me. Obviously he wanted to be there. And I do think that he resented me a little bit for that. Um, You know, but it was just the circumstances of the situation and there wasn't anything that we could do but move forward. And it really, you know, I think for him and talking to him afterwards, he put aside his feelings of resentment that day and just tried to focus on my feelings and how I was doing. And, and I really appreciated that from him. And I think that that's, excuse me, like something that more, more men, you know, need to, at least for that day, you know, when it happens, just put aside their feelings and, and, you know, communicate, to their spouse. What do you need? What can I do for you? And then, you know, I'm happy to process those feelings with him, but yeah, I'm sure there was a little bit of resentment and, you know, I know that obviously he was, he was devastated as well. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest thing is just communicating, you know, communicating with each other about what you need at any Mm -hmm. given time. Sure. Sure. And every relationship is going to have some difficult times for sure. Now, um, just thinking about holidays, and you mentioned that you'd had a miscarriage the day after Christmas. So, my gosh, um, holidays, you know, just in general, can bring so many feelings out for people. And I'm, and I'm not trying to throw salt in the wound, but as I think about when this episode might come out, and um, and just you know, the reminder sometimes, you know, like like you said, if you see a pregnant woman you know, that might make you feel some type of way. You know, if you're shopping in Target and you happen to walk by a baby aisle, you know, that could be triggering. Um, How, you know, do you find days like Father's Day, Mother's Day, Christmas, are they, are they triggering? And if they are, how do you kind of get through that? They definitely are triggering. And I don't want to take away from how anybody feels on any certain holiday. Um, but yeah, they definitely, I would say for us, Christmas is probably the hardest. Um, Mother's Day and Father's Day, 
we look at our, our dogs as our children. So we actually do get cards um, for each other from the dogs. And a lot of times we'll put, you know, their paw prints in them and things. So Aww. for us, you know, we just, we just think of them as our children. So Mother's Day and Father's Day are a little easier for us. I know they're very triggering for other people and I completely validate that. Um, you know, Christmas, I think, is the hardest one just because of what had happened around that time for us. Um, and the way that we have gotten through it, and I actually just, I wrote an article um, on my, for my newsletter and my sub stack on this recently. It was kind of like a child-free Christmas how-to, but we we created new traditions for ourselves that didn't revolve around children. You know, Christmas is definitely marketed as a children's holiday, but it doesn't mean, I think a lot of times we as adults forget that we can have fun too. Um, And so we decided, you know, each year we do something different. Um, We, you know, go and walk around the neighborhood and look at everybody's displays and Christmas decorations. And we take our dogs, you know, because that's our family. Uh, We do go, you know, to, we live somewhat close to Hershey Park. So they have Christmas candy lane. So we do that as a couple. Um, You know, one year we just stayed in and and played games, you know, uh, board games and card games. And so I think it's just finding out what, you know, what Christmas means to you outside of, you know, the family setting. And we obviously still see family, um, you know, because I don't think it's it's not healthy for us. I don't want to speak for other people. It's not healthy for us to just completely shut ourselves in, um, you know, away from the world during that time. So that socialization and just, you know, being a part of the celebrations does help us. But yeah, just creating your own traditions, remembering that Christmas is and any holiday really is what you make it. And you can either choose to, you know, spend it in kind of that headspace of, negativity and and if that feels right for you on any given day that's fine I don't want to don't want to say that that's not but you know over the long run it's not healthy to do that and so we just decided like well what do we you know what are other traditions that we can start as a family of two you know maybe including our dogs and so that's what we do um and it's yeah we've really enjoyed it we've really tried to just make it something that means something to us and is, you know, a day that we can also have fun. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love the new traditions and, um, and kind of making it, you know, being creative with it like that, just, you know, finding what works for you now, how, um, now that you've made this decision to be childless, uh, what positive things have you seen come from this? Now that you have grieved this, you have decided, you know, new reality, So for maybe others who are, again, maybe having a hard time kind of finding the positive um, or maybe wondering like, okay, maybe should I just stop? You know, maybe we we just want to stop this journey. Um, What are some of the positive things that you've been experiencing since then? Yeah, honestly, when we made the decision, it was a huge relief off of our shoulders because we just felt like, okay, we don't have to keep chasing this carrot anymore that may or may not come. Um, And so, you know, a lot of the positives have really come from just the possibilities really of what we can do now um, without having our lives completely controlled by this one pursuit. And, you know, I'm riding my horse more again and my husband's able to, you know, take hunting trips and it doesn't have to revolve, revolve around our, you know, my ovulation schedule and, you know, we're really looking to the future in terms of, okay, we, we are going to have, you know, different finances than our siblings with children. And so what can we do with that? You know, how can we, um, you know, we do give a lot to our nieces and nephews. Uh, we have nine of them. So we do enjoy, you know, being the aunt and uncle that they can come to without fear of repercussion of their parents, you know, like just kind of being that mentor figure, to other children, um, that obviously aren't ours. And yeah, just looking, you know, we're just really excited about traveling and, you know, um, building a horse barn on our property and just kind of all the things that 
we had put on hold for so many years because it was just the unknown. It was just something that was out of our control. So it was a big relief to feel like our lives were obviously nobody's ever totally in control, but (laughs) to feel like our lives at least had, you know, some sort of direction again that we were moving in and, um, yeah, just kind of being, uh, excited again about the future and about what that can hold and still having children in our lives. Like it doesn't mean that, you know, we don't want to ever be around kids. I mean, like I said, we have our nieces and nephews and we love spending time with them and we babysit, you know, when the parents go away. And so just because you make that decision doesn't mean that you're cutting children out of your lives for the, you know, for the rest of them. If that's what feels right for you, that's fine. Um, But we found that bringing them back in was actually really healing for us and a way for us to, you know, kind of have both sides to be able to enjoy them and then also, you know, give them back at the end of the day. So, yeah, just I think um, just excitement for for the future and things that we'll be able to do and ways that we'll be able to give back. And, um, yeah, we're just we're just looking forward to it. That's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah, it doesn't have to be one way or the other. You can kind of make a blended mix of both, kind of combine both worlds. Yeah. Now, um, let me ask you this. So is there any advice or support that maybe you can share with others who just, you know, so desperately wanted to become a mom? I mean, you've kind of already shared some of that stuff already, but is there any advice or so? I mean, I, obviously you have your podcast, which I've already mentioned, but I mean, maybe other resources to help others? I think my biggest piece of advice outside of, you know, just person to person or human to human is don't give in to all the toxic positivity that's out there around fertility and infertility. I think it does a very big disservice, you know, to, especially on social media for all of us to see, you know, oh, this 70 year old woman had twins, you know, and, um, this celebrity, you know, was able to pay for this surrogate and she was fine. And, and that's great for them. I'm not taking away from that, but all the sentiments of, you know, don't give up, don't, um, you know, it'll happen one day. Like you'll get your miracle praying for you. Like those are all, I'm sure well-intentioned, but don't get caught up in that. I mean, it's not, you can also choose, to end your family building journey and still live a good life, you know, still live a fulfilled, joyful life. You don't have to keep chasing that carrot that you may never get. I mean, parenthood is never a guarantee for any of us, let alone those of us that, you know, try to go out and pay for it, so to speak. So, you know, just don't buy into all that toxic positivity. Do what is right for you and your own family situation. And, you know, it's going to be okay. Like you're going to be okay, regardless of the outcome. There is, there are people out there that are in your same situation that will support you and talk you through it. Um, You know, like I said, the sweet grapes is a great resource. There's also a lot of childless, um, child-free communities popping up out there now, which is great. Um, I work with one here locally called Sweet Grace Ministries. um, And, you know, there's a lot of groups on social media that you can join. So I would definitely encourage you, whether you want to share your story or not, or whether you want to be just a silent member, just, you know, include yourself in that so you can kind of see the dialogue and see that you're not the only one that's going through this. Um, Because I think that that is half the battle. It's something that a lot of us are still silent about and feel alone in. And that's just not the case. So I would encourage you to, you know, reach out to all those resources. Like I said, even if you never post, never want to share your story, you know, just to know that there's people out there that have this commonality with you. Yeah, I think there's definitely strength in numbers, right? As they Mm -hmm. say. (laughs) <laughs> just to Absolutely, know that, you know, you're yeah. not alone. <laughs> now, yeah. something you said, and I didn't even think about asking this until you just mentioned it. You said that your journey was private, but others may have shared with family members, oh, we're trying. Um, or maybe if they did experience something, maybe that leaked out to the family. 
what advice do you have for people who maybe they have decided to stop trying, maybe they've experienced something traumatic, but they have that family member that just gets a little too personal, or maybe again, you know, of course they're good intention, we, you know, we're assuming, but maybe you're just, you don't, you know, it's just a boundary, you know, it's a boundary or it's just, you, you just don't want to answer it. So how do mm-hmm. you, how do, how do people handle that question? How do they handle that conversation? What would you suggest they say or do in that situation? Yeah. And family is hard because we don't want to, you know, obviously isolate them or ourselves from it. I think it's different than, you know, strangers on the street or coworkers or even friends. Um, You know, family, we try to keep those bridges intact as much as we can, but that's one of the areas where it's the most important to have healthy boundaries because you do see those people and they do have a great impact on, you know, what you think and what you uh, you know, the, the direction that you think your life should go or the expectations that they have for you to, so to speak. So yeah, it's a great question. And the way that we handled it, you know, once we finally came out and told our families is we, we just said, you know, we were just honest with them. We were direct. We said, look, you know, we have been trying for a very long time. We don't want to talk about it with you, you know, because we don't want the opinions, we don't want the pity. Um, but just know that we have tried or are trying if you're still in that journey. And, you know, that we want you to respect our privacy with that. And if they don't respect that, you know, then you do need to put up more boundaries and you need to say, look, if this is something that you just can't, you know, seem to let go of or that you have this sort of burning desire to you know, know what's going on in our business. Um, you know, we're just, we're not going to participate in that. We're not going to come around as much, you know, that's, it's going to be put the ball in their court. Like, you know, let them know, like, this is what I need. This is what I would like from you. And if they can't respect that and can't do that, then you need to pull back until they can. And that's not being selfish. That's not being, rude, you know, as long as you are honest and open with them and and lay out, you know, exactly what you want and exactly what you need, if they don't respect that, then that's on them and not you. Now, will the conversation sound different, you think, then with friends or coworkers? And if it does, what would that sound like? Yeah, I think it's a little different, you know, in that obviously you don't want to burn bridges with anybody, or at least we didn't, but you can be a little bit more forceful about it and you can pull back a little bit sooner, I think, you know, with coworkers and, and maybe friends that aren't quite as close as family. Um, you know, so I've just flat out said sometimes to coworkers, like if, you know, they're having a conversation about their kids or then they start asking, you know, they would start asking me like, well, you know, why don't you have kids or, you know, and this was years ago, but I would just say, you know, it's really none of your business and I don't appreciate you talking about it or asking me that question. And I'm not, you know, I'm not comfortable with this conversation. So again, you don't have to be rude about it, but really I don't understand. And I think I'll never understand why this question, you know, the whole, when are you going to have kids or why don't you have kids? I, I'll never really understand why that is an appropriate or why society thinks that's an appropriate question to ask women um, as opposed to really anything else. You know, uh, your body is your body and it's your business and nobody else's. So I think it just differs with coworkers and friends and, and even people you meet on the street in that you can be a little bit more forceful right from the gate or right out of the gate. Um, without feeling too much, you know, remorse about it. Mm -hmm. And I like how you said you can simply say, you know, I'm just not comfortable with this conversation. And if that doesn't kind of send the message to the person Mm -hmm. you're talking to that, you know, this conversation is off limits, then, you know, I guess you can always walk away at that point. But that should pretty much, very, you know, get, get the message across. So I think that's definitely helpful. Now, is there anything else that I haven't asked you today that uh, that you'd like to share with the listeners or maybe any thoughts or words of wisdom? Yeah, I think just, 
you know, it's okay, no matter how you feel and no matter what decision you make, whether it's, you know, in your family building journey or whether or not you even want to have children, like that is your choice. And there is nothing wrong with whatever your answer to that question is. And I really want people, I think especially women, to not be so judgmental to other women about that choice. And it really is nobody else's business but you and your partners and maybe even sometimes just yours, really. Um, And so I just hope that people realize, you know, one, they're not alone in whatever decision they make, whether they want to stay child free or whether they, you know, go through infertility and decide not to have children or, you know, they have 10 children. It's it's their decision. They're not alone in it. There's always someone out there that is going to have walked in your shoes and will be able to, you know, be there for you and, and communicate with you in a way that is like, yeah, this person really gets it. So you need to find those people. Um, you know, find your support system and hold on to that. Um, But also just be kind and don't ask that question. You know, don't ask people about their family building journey unless they want to openly share it with you first. Um, And yeah, just just be kind, I think, (laughs) is the biggest Mm -hmm. thing because you never know what people are dealing with. And, um, you know, it's just not something that most people are comfortable sharing and that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Charlie, thank you so much for sharing your personal journey with us. I think there's a lot of women that are going to resonate uh, and men too, you know, maybe their, their wives have gone through this and they've seen them just, you know, deal with, with um, the pain and the healing and the grieving. So um, I will link all of Charlie's uh, social Uh, links in the description below so that you can get in touch with her and get uh, your hands on some of her resources as well, because she is all about supporting women in this space. So Charlie, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah. Thank you, Lexi, for having me. It was really fun. To be part of the exclusive listener group, hit the follow button on whichever podcast platform you're listening to right now. When you follow, you'll be the first to know about new episodes so you can listen before anyone else. You'll also have quick access to the show, making it convenient to find for the next time. For more free content, join me on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and online at peaceofmepodcast.com.